Okay, so greetings everyone once again and welcome to the 103rd session of the online Optom Learning Series, OLS. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, everyone, our speaker for today. So today we have Dr. Sezad Naru. He is the reader at Aston University in the UK and he teaches in the area of anterior eye. He obtained his first degree at the Aston University and then a master's and a doctorate degree at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. He is also the examiner for the UK College of Optometrists and an international assessor for the General Optical Council. He also advises for medical legal ophthalmic cases. He is a visiting professor at the American University of Science and Technology in Lebanon, Beirut, and also at the King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. He was also awarded the International Optometrist of the Year by the World Council of Optometry in 2015. He is the Honorary Fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, BCLA and a global president of International Association of Contact Lens Educators, which is IACL. His research areas include contact lenses, dry eye, corneal biomechanics, laser refractive surgeries, cataract and lens surgery, intraocular lenses, sports vision, and business aspect of the UK eye health care model. He has authored numerous papers in peer reviewed journals, about 150 publications, including research papers, editorials, textbook chapters as well. He has successfully supervised a lot of doctorate as well as master students. And most importantly, I think for today's talk, he is going to talk to us uh, uh, more about publication so he is also the editor in chief of the BCLA journal, which is the contact lens and anterior eye, uh, which was also awarded, or I would say that it had the raise uh, of the impact factor in the year 2019 by about 30% and was ranked 20 out of the 60 most ranked ophthalmic journals. So keeping that in mind with his expertise in that particular field of publication and research and being an editor of that wonderful journal, I think people who are into contact lens teaching practice, uh, we have been reading papers in, uh, in CLAE or contact lens and anterior eye. And with that respect, uh, today, sir, is going to talk to us about how should we go about publishing our work, trying to answer some doubts and probably give us some tips on what we should and what we should not to get uh, work published. So thank you, sir, coming uh, onto our platform yet once again. But, uh, you know, first time you did a contact lens oriented topic, but today it's completely different uh, publication. Thank you so much for accepting our invite once again. And uh, uh, let me just leave the screen time to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fakhruddin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, yes, uh, uh, as many of you will be aware, I spoke to you last summer, and that was the 50th um, session for the uh, Optometry Online lecture series. And it was more on a contact lens topic. But um, And I was wearing my hat as IACL president at that time. But now I'm wearing my hat as the editor-in-chief of the journal Contact Lens and Anterior Eye. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about publishing your work and how you uh, send work to journals and things like this. Now, the first thing you might ask yourself is, why do we want to publish our work? Um, is there any point to publishing our work? Well, yes, most definitely. And, um, you know, you will be seeing interesting patients that you will see in your practice, in your universities, even as students. And those may be interesting case reports that you want to share with other people. Now, especially for the students, you often have to write a thesis, maybe an undergraduate thesis, a master's or a doctorate thesis, and you have to do a literature review. You have to search the literature on a certain topic. And your literature review could become a nice review paper for the journals as well. And you may also be involved in studies and clinical trials where you're comparing 
one product to another product, or you're comparing how one machine works versus another machine, or uh, how patients um, manage with a certain treatment uh, or a certain outcome from a surgical procedure, and you want to share that information with the wider community. So that's why we publish our work. Now, as Fakhrudin already mentioned that I'm the editor of this journal, Contact Lens and Anterior Eye. So that's the, uh, the logo on the uh, right-hand side of the slide that you can see in front of you. I just wanted to, first of all, talk about the, uh, in the journal, we have, um, uh, you know, I'm the editor-in-chief in of this journal, uh, but we also have associate editors and uh, we have associate editors in, in the regions and uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we have Pauline Cho. Uh, we have Robin Chalmers in the USA. Eric Pappas and Stephen Vincent in Australia. And Yves van der Warp, actually, he, he stepped down now and he was in Europe as well, like myself, but uh, he handed over to Stephen Vincent. So what are the types of publications that we typically would have for, for any journal, not just for, for this journal? Well, I mentioned already a review article. These are um, where you would go into the existing literature, you would look and do a search on Science Direct and PubMed and Scopus and other search engines for papers. And you will collect all the information on a certain topic. And then you will write summaries. You might even do a meta-analysis where you compare the analyses from different papers. And from a journal point of view, we like review papers. We like them because they are cited very well. People will often quote the information from a review paper. So for example, if we have a review paper on keratoconus and you're writing uh, a clinical trial comparing two different contact lenses in keratoconus, you need the basic information about keratoconus and that will be found in that one big review paper. So you will cite that work. And that journal gets recognized whenever you cite that work. So journals like review papers. Now, universities, they don't really count review papers as original research. So um, in, in, my, in my university, for example, when you're applying for promotions, they want to know your details of your full length papers and they don't count the review articles. So in one respect, they're very well respected, but maybe in, in your in, own institution, they are looked upon differently. So what's, what's a full length paper? Well, a full length paper can be of many different things, uh, but this is usually original research from the authors. So you have conducted an experiment and you've compared two products, you've compared two techniques, you're reporting the outcomes of surgery, et cetera. And just remember that your author list should include the people involved in the study. It might be that you didn't collect the data yourself that you had a technician or a student or a coworker who collected the data, they should still be listed as an author on the paper. And I had an experience actually once where um, a PhD student from another country wrote to me and said that um, the professor who was in charge of that PhD published his work, but didn't put the student's name on the work. And this is you know, considered to be uh, publication malpractice. So it's not actually good practice to, to do that. So that would need to be rectified. Now, a short communication might be something where um, you need to tell people some information because maybe you had um, a, a, an unusual way of calculating something and you want to show people the equation that you have, but you haven't really researched it fully yet. So this can be like a technical note or a commentary. Uh, it can even be uh, linked to the next one, which is a letter, where you write a letter to the editor. And if you're writing a letter to the editor, that could be because you've seen something unusual, you want to tell everybody about this, or maybe you read something in this journal that you wanted to make a comment about. And we, have, we very often get letters to the editor where the, the, somebody will say, uh, you know, in the last issue of this journal, there was an article by this person, and I disagree with the conclusion for this reason. And they will write their reason, and this is in a letter to the editor. So they're not doing a full research project. They're making a comment about a published piece of work. Now, most journals will allow the original authors of the article to reply to that. So often you will have an article, 
maybe a letter to the editor about that article and then a reply to that uh, letter from the authors. And then we will have a edi an editorial. An editorial starts the, the journal, uh, it's the first piece in the journal, and it could be just a commentary about something which is happening. You know, in the last year, we've seen many editorials about uh, COVID-19, for example, uh, but it could be an editorial that's related to some of the papers in that issue of that journal. It could also be what we call a guest editorial. So for example, somebody is invited to write an editorial on the area of expertise. And this is where we would think, okay, who is the global expert in this area? We need someone to make a comment, to write some commentary about this topic. So they, they will be invited to do a guest editorial. So I'm just gonna go through the common failings that people sometimes get wrong. Now your article, if it's a full article, should have a title. And it should also have an abstract. An abstract is a small summary of the work. And some journals ask for what they call a structured abstract, where they need purpose, method, result, conclusion. And in the abstract, you don't really need to put references because that will be in the full paper. But this is just something when somebody is searching for this paper, they will find the abstract first, they will read that. And then they will decide whether they want to read the whole paper because they've read this short summary and if it's useful for them. Then the methodology, the results, discussion, conclusions. I'm going to talk about these separately in a second. Other things that you need to say is you need to declare an interest. So, for example, if you are the inventor of a certain contact lens design, you need to declare that if that's what your paper is about. You need to say, you know, if, you're, if your study is about contact lens um, alpha beta and you say, today I'm going to compare the contact lens alpha beta with the daily disposable lenses from uh, Bausch & Lomb, so, for example. Well, if you're the inventor of the alpha beta lens, you need to tell people because maybe your opinion is biased because you have this declaration of interest. Or maybe you didn't invent it, but you have shares in the company then you need to declare that. Maybe you're an employee of that company. Again, you need to declare that. So you need to be open and honest with your declarations. In most countries, you need ethical approval when you're doing studies invo involving human subjects. So you need to declare this. And in some countries where you don't need ethical approval, that's uh, when, when these papers come to the journal, the editor will ask, why didn't you get ethical approval? So is the thing that you're doing, is it ethically sound you know for example if we are doing um treatments for coronavirus or for example vaccination it's no point if we vaccinate people with a placebo and say okay look, we're going to expose them to coronavirus that's a, that's unethical so um you know we can't do an unethical study and then the common things plagiarism copying chunks of work from other sources and not referencing it properly. If you want to copy something from somebody else's paper, you need to put it in italics and say this information came from another journal. <clears throat> but <clears throat> most um, journals have software to detect whether you have copied information from another source. And they can apply to the author and say, don't copy from this source. And even some people sometimes copy from their old papers that they self plagiarize. They plagiarize from their own previous work they don't want to rewrite some information. Statistics, you must get statistics correct. Uh, and that's just generally the design and presentation of the paper, the grammar, the spelling, the style, the writing style, which I'll talk about separately and pictures I'll talk about separately. And I think this is quite a nice quote, how not to write. Imagine you have to write a clinical note to a professor of uh, medicine who has a concentration span of about 15 minutes, he's got a short temper, and he hates slang and colloquialisms and abstract terminology and philosophy. And uh, this was actually written by, this statement was made by a, uh, an editor of another journal. And, uh, and he said, this is a good thing to think about if you're writing a, a paper. So what he's basically saying is, don't just write nonsense, write in a succinct way, in a short way so that the information can be received by the reader in a very easy fashion so don't just write long elaborate sentences you know for example if you um, had to put 
uh, one drop in the right eye and a different drop in the left eye, you don't want to write, the patient walked into the room, he sat down, I asked him to open his eyes, then I held his eyelids, and then he uh, opened his eyelids, and then I put one drop from the, my right hand into his right eye, uh, and then I asked him to open the left eye, and then he did this. We don't want to hear that. You know, we want to say drop A was placed in the right eye, drop B was placed in the left eye. And it's quite simple. Now, the different types of studies, um, in, in this pyramid, the sort of, uh, if you like, the most powerful studies are the top ones and the weakest ones are the bottom ones. So if we start from the bottom, a case report is, is deemed to be the weakest type of study. And this is basically where you've seen something and you report it. And then I have a case series where you've seen something, but you've seen it more than once. You've seen it in 10 patients. So you can report the case series. Then you can have a pilot study where you can say, okay, well, I want to try this out. I want to try out my, my idea on a small group of people. And then we have the case control studies, cohort studies, where we, we recruit bigger groups of people. And kind of linked to that is what we call the randomized controlled trials. And often you'll see uh, drug trials are randomized controlled drug trials, for example. And then we have a meta-analysis where you look at all the papers published in that area, maybe all the randomized controlled trials, including the studies, including the pilot studies, including the case series. You put them all together and you do a statistical analysis on the whole cohorts that you've received, all, all the information that you found on that topic. Searching the literature is very important. It's very important to find out if somebody has done this before. You know, for example, if I wanted to know what is the prevalence of myopia in rural Punjabi area. So I will say, OK, I want to write this. But maybe somebody already did it. Maybe somebody already did that study. So I need to search the literature. Now, maybe somebody didn't do it in Punjab, but they did it in UP or uh, another area. So then you can look at the literature and see, OK, did, is my question that I want to ask, my research question, has it already been answered? So you need to be thorough with your literature review. And if you can find good review papers, you should also find the original paper. So for, for example, um, if you wanted to, if you were doing a study on the um, contrast sensitivity charts, for example, and you find a good review paper from two years ago, which talks about all the contrast sensitivity charts, but a lot of your work is talking about the bailey Lovey chart. Well, then you need to find the original papers that talk about the Bailey Lovey chart. The original papers by Bailey and Lovey where they talked about these charts and how they validated them. So you should find the original source papers as well. However, sometimes we can't find that original source paper. Sometimes that paper might be too old, for example. Um, you know, for, for example, the, um, uh, the, one of the original uh, papers by Zernicke, for example, uh, about uh, high water aberrations, 1961, was in uh, in a foreign language. It wasn't in English. It was in, in, in Russian. It was in a journal called Biophysica. And so you, you, maybe you can't read that. Maybe you can't find that original paper. But maybe 10 years ago, somebody did use that paper and they cited that paper. So that person 10 years ago in 2011, you will say, so you, you, know, you might make a comment and say, um, you know, in brackets, you would say uh, Zernike 1961 cited by Smith 2011. So that tells the reader that you didn't get the original paper, but you got the paper that cited it. So this is a way of referencing information that maybe you can't get hold of. Now, the writing style, look at the journal, look at the journal and see what style people have written in in that journal. And your work should be in a similar sort of style. Remember, the reader doesn't want to read pages and pages. And certainly as an editor, if I read, if I find too many pages in a, so a paper, sometimes we reject the paper because we don't have that many pages spare in the journal to publish lots and lots of pages. And I want to read quality, not quantity. We're very keen that you have good grammar, punctuation, the correct use of capitals, paragraphs, etc. However, don't worry if English is not your first language. You can have your work checked by an English language editor or by somebody who is a native English speaker, because what's most important is the science. Is the science interesting and novel and, and worthy of publication for this journal? 
For contact lens and anterior eye, we use a writing style called third person passive style. So for example, um, you know, you would say an experiment was performed to investigate and you don't write, I or we will perform an experiment. And you don't say things like our results show, you would say the results show. You, you wouldn't say, um, we believe this is the first time this has ever been done. No, you would say, uh, it is believed that this is the first time this has been shown, something like that. So you write in what we call third person style and you don't use personal pronouns. So remember in the abstract, in the structured abstract, um, you have a purpose, a method. Now in the results section of an abstract, don't just write the results of this study will be discussed in the paper because that doesn't tell anybody anything. You need to put some results in the results section. And in the conclusion section, don't just say that um, this study shows that further work is required. That's not enough. You need to make some conclusions from the data that you have. And if you've presented this work elsewhere or you have a commercial interest, like we said before, then you need to declare that as well. So let me go through the, the various sections in the, in the paper. In the introduction, you need to be very clear about the research question. What is it you're trying to find out? So your introduction should build up to this. And then the last part of the introduction, you state the research question, the research aims uh, of this study. And then um, you leave your methods to the next section. In the methods, you explain in enough detail the experiment that you've conducted so that if somebody reads your methods, they can duplicate that experiment. And if you name an instrument, for example, you use the, um, the Oculus Pentacam, then in brackets, the first time you mention Oculus Pentacam, you need to write in brackets, uh, Oculus, um, Germany, you know, uh, uh, Giesen, Germany, wherever the instrument is made. You know? So if you had the Nidec machine, uh, you would say, um, we use the Magellan Mapper topography machine from NIDEC, then in brackets you would say NIDEC, uh, Gamagori, Japan. So the name of the company, the city they're from, and the country they're from, in brackets, but only the first time. After that, you can mention the instrument without mentioning the country and the manufacturer. You might want to have subheadings, equipment, patient selection, inclusion or, or exclusion criteria, something like that in your methods as well. But what you shouldn't have in your methods, you shouldn't say we recruited 25 patients or 25 subjects because that's a result. The fact you had 25 is a result. So also think about figures. Um, and your figures should be described as figures. Don't say this is graph one and picture one and picture two. All of them are called figures and figure one, figure two. Now, most journals like you to put the figures in a separate document and have what they call figure legends. And a figure legend is an explanatory caption underneath it, which tells the reader what's going on in that graph or that picture. And the figure legend is quite important. Now, just to give you an example, uh, this is um, a, a study that I did many, many years ago. It's actually part of my PhD. And um, we were looking at plastic that had laser, eczema laser um, ablation on it. So we, we blasted the plastic with an eczema laser, uh, refractive surgery laser. And then we wanted to see the quality of the optical lens created on the plastic. And we used this setup um, to measure what they call physio interfer interference fringes. And it's a monochromatic source. Now I won't describe the whole thing, but if I describe it, it's actually quite complicated to describe how we did this. So in the paper, we kept it quite simple. I drew a very simple diagram and you can see here, there's a camera at the top, then there's an eyepiece, then there's a vertical illuminator. And you can see on one side, there's a sodium lamp, which sends the monochromatic light. Then there's an objective lens. And then there's the um, ablated lens and the, the curvature, this, the spherical lens of the same curvature to give you the interference fringes. So very easily in a picture, we can describe a very complicated method. So in the methods, we can, we can describe it, but it might be very complicated. And then we can say, see figure three. And then figure three, we can have a figure legend here and say, figure three uh, shows 
the setup to obtain the uh, monochromatic interference fringes, um, camera at the top, lamp on the side, etc. So you can explain the, the figure in the figure legend. Now, remember the, the number of subjects you had is a result. So you would start your results with the demographic data. So in this study, 25 patients were recruited, 12 males, 13 females. Um, mean age was 25.2 plus or minus 10.2. And then you might describe what statistics you're going to use. But then think about what is the best way to show your results? That might be a table. It might be a graph. But don't do both. So don't have a graph and a table that both show the same thing. So you have one or the other. You choose which is the best way. And don't just repeat all the information from the text. In the text, you might just have the key pieces of information, but in the graph or the table, you have all the information. But here, you don't need to explain the results. You're going to save the explanation for later. Here, the reader should be able to look at your results and they can explain it for themselves. They can say, oh yeah, he has a very strange finding there and the table shows a very big number there. So that must mean this. So they're making their own interpretation from your results. But in your discussion, this is where you need to explain your results. You need to explain your results in relation to your original research question and aims. How do your results relate to other people's results from the literature review that you presented in the introduction? Do your results suggests that you need to defer the work on this. And are there any weaknesses in your results? These are all the things that you should be discussing in your discussion and conclusion. And how could my study be improved? And then finally, you might want a, a paragraph or a sentence or two, which I always call, so what? You know, and, and, and think of it like this, you know, you're explaining your experiment to somebody and at the end they say, well, you did all those things, that's interesting. And you found this and you found that and you've explained it to me, but so what? What does it mean to future research? What does it mean to future clinical practice? What does it mean to patient uh, outcomes? You know, what does it mean? What is the take home message? You know, does your result mean that the care of these type of patients is gonna be improved in the future? Does your conclusion mean that um, you proved what other people were already thinking or you found the opposite of what other people were thinking? So you need to give me the kind of the, really the important bit right at the end so I can see, ah, okay, I can see there's an important part to this paper now. Lots of other information is required. Things like the title of the paper is very important. Don't Make sure your title of your paper is related to the paper and it's related to the content of the paper. And sometimes you have a very um, uh, you know, ambiguous title, which doesn't really mean anything and doesn't relate to the data you're presenting. Now, some journals require a cover letter. Some, some of them do it online now. And that's basically, dear editor, we have submitted our paper. And they basically want you to say whether you've published it somewhere else, whether you've published part of it, whether you've presented part of it. You know, for example, at the BCLA, you could say that we are submitting to you our paper. This has not been presented in full anywhere. However, a, a pilot study of this work was presented at the 2019 BCLA conference, something like that. Many journals will ask you to suggest reviewers and you can suggest people who you think are experts in this field, but be careful. You should all always use their uh, correct email address. If you put Hotmail and Gmail addresses, usually the editors won't use them because um, you know, that could be anybody. But if it's an institutional email address, they know that this person is legitimate, this is a correct institution, and they will email that person to um, ask them to review that paper as well. Most journals require a title page. Now, when you submit your paper, the title page often doesn't go to the reviewers. And the title page has your name, your university or clinic name, what funding you have, the declarations, who are the authors? Who's the corresponding author? Who's going to receive all the emails back and forward from the journal? And what are the key words? But that title page doesn't go to anybody else. It just goes to the editor. And um, remember, I said it before, but the online submission platform that journals use can detect whether you've copied the work from another source as well. So what type of journals do we have? Well, we have online journals only. We have hard copy journals. 
journals which are subscription, you, just, you buy the journal, or open access journals, journals which belong to a society would be classed as subs uh, subscription journals. Then you can have peer reviewed journals and non peer reviewed journals as well. Now, Content Lens Anterior Eye is very proudly a, a peer reviewed journal. And that be, basically means when you publish in a peer reviewed journal, you get more kudos. It's, it's, it's considered to be a more respectable journal uh, for public publications because the information has been checked by other people more thoroughly. In a non-peer reviewed journal, it's checked by the, the editor and the editorial team, but it doesn't go out for independent peer review. But non-peer review journals sometimes will pay you for those articles. You know, in the UK, we have the Optician magazine and Optometry Today magazine, and these would be classed as non-peer review, and they pay the authors to publish in those uh, journals. Um, and they go to many more people. You know, the Content Lens and Anterior Eye Journal goes to the libraries that receive that, but the Optician Magazine and Optometry Today goes to pretty much every optometrist in the country. So you know, it depends who do you want to read your work. Now, what about case reports? Are they important? Well, as I said before, the case report is one of the lowest and weakest levels of evidence, but it's the first line of evidence. And things like... Um, the thalidomide problem that we had in the 1960s in the UK was first reported in a case report. Toxic shock syndrome and AIDS also were first reported as case reports. And then later on, trials, etc., and full-length articles came after that. But the case report does matter, especially if you're reporting something new. If you're just reporting, uh, you know, I, I rejected a couple of papers last week, for example, which were... Um, you know, fitting of a keratoconic patient with the new scleral contact lens. It's not new because it might be a new design of contact lens, but we've been using scleral lenses for keratoconics for many, many years. So what's the novel thing? Well, the novel thing for that person was they wanted to show how this, this new contact lens design was working well on keratoconic patients. And in fact, the person who was writing the case report was, um, was an employee of the company as well that made this contact lens. So there's a commercial aspect. So the paper was rejected. It doesn't offer anything new to the readers apart from publicizing this new lens. Now, this is quite a complicated picture. I don't expect you to take all this in, but it's just to show you um, kind of what happens with a paper when it comes to um, a journal. So we start with the gold box at the top. A new submission uh, is received by an editor. And sometimes I send that back to the author and say, you forgot to do this, you forgot to do that. Can you change this and change that? And then send it back to me. And they, they, they do that. Very, very rarely, we accept the paper straight away. Usually it goes straight to peer review. So it goes down to peer review. And it might be that we reject it straight away then. Or we accept it after the peer review. But after the peer review, it might be that we ask for the paper to be modified. And those could be minor revisions or major revisions. And if it's a major revision, usually the paper is re-reviewed. If it's a minor revision, usually just the editor will check that and the editor makes the decision. So you can see the process here. Um, but even a paper that goes uh, has been requested for minor or major revisions, especially major revisions, might be rejected. That doesn't mean just because you've been asked to do revisions, the paper will be accepted. And, and this is sometimes where authors get upset because they'll say, my original paper went to peer review and... I was asked to make some changes. I spent a long time making those changes and then you rejected my paper. You know, so it's, you know, sometimes it's not just the editor's decision, but also the reviewer's decision that they didn't feel that work was still up to scratch. Now, how to address editors, co uh, reviewers' comments. Um, the reviewers will send you a list of comments and what you should be doing is looking at these comments and, you know, if, if one of the comments was, um, you know, on line 53, the sentence doesn't make sense, then what I would say is draw a table and write the reviewer's comments on once, copy the reviewer's comments into one box. And on the right-hand side, say how you've ch addressed that comment. So if sentence on line 53 didn't make sense, you can say, uh, sorry about this. Uh, thank you for checking it. We have changed the grammar of that sentence and it's been reworded and now reads better. Or, you know, the, the comment from the review might be, um, the authors should add a table um, to explain the results in a m more um, efficient way. 
highlighter changes. Usually we would use Word documents and use track changes. Now I'm just going to go through some, uh, this is uh, quite confidential data actually. This is data from um, contact lens and anterior eye. And um, this is over the years, the number of papers that are submitted and um, rejected and accepted. And you can see that, you know, you can see the, the uh, number, the orange boxes, for example, on the top line, these are the number of submissions. And this was, this data was collected until uh, November, 8th of November last year. Uh, in fact, at the end of the year, we had more than 500 papers, but you can see that in 2020, we had way more papers than in 2019. We had you know, more than 50% increase in the number of submitted papers. 2019, 2018, you can see the numbers are very similar, just over 300. Previous to that, just under 300. So you can see that you know, the pandemic, the lockdown situation, people were sitting at home writing papers. You know, they had lots of spare time. But what that does mean is the rejection rate goes up. Now in 2020, our rejection rate was nearly 80%. And more than half of those papers the orange box on the bottom line now, were what we call desk reject. And that's basically where they're rejected before they're sent for peer review because the paper doesn't meet all the criteria or it's not interesting enough or it's not novel or it's very poorly written or it's on a topic which might not be relevant to this journal or is you know, it's only loosely relevant to the journal. But that changes, you know, for example, Five years ago in Content and Anterior Eye, we were publishing a lot of papers around uh, biometry for intraocular lens calculations. Nowadays, that type of paper would probably be rejected because we have enough papers on the main themes of the journal, which are the contact lens and anterior eye type problems. Again, just to show, give you some more data of where papers are coming from, which countries you can see, um, you know. The, you know, the, the majority of our papers actually come from Asia. And um, you know, Turkey is a country where they, they send us lots and lots of papers. Uh, and you can see that's going up each year. The USA is pretty steady in the number of papers. UK is pretty steady in the number of papers. Uh, China is sending us more and more papers. For example, Iran is sending us more papers. Spain is sending us more papers. So you can see some countries are sending out. India is sending us more as well. And this is the accepted papers per country. and. Uh, in fact, let me go to the next one. This is probably a little bit easier to understand. Um, so these are the countries that are submitting papers and which countries are being rejected more. So you can see, for example, that um, in lots of papers are coming in from Turkey, but lots of them are being rejected. Now, that was because they, they weren't really on the main theme of the journal. They were more surgical papers um, than contact lens and anterior eye diagnostic type papers. Now, compare that to, for example, in the UK, where 25 papers were submitted and 18 were accepted. You know, so it's, you know, those authors in the UK are understanding the remit of the journal better than the authors in Turkey or maybe China or something like that. This is the 2019 data uh, as well, just to, if, if you're interested in that as well, that's the countries. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole table because it's quite a lot of information here, but I just wanted to show you, this is um, in, in 2020, we published around, sorry, we accepted around 101 papers. So that's just the bit that's been circled. And that's the bottom number, 101 papers. Now, of those accepted papers, two were case reports. So only two were case reports. So just you know, make sure if you're going to submit a case report, make sure it's interesting, it's novel, it hasn't been reported elsewhere, it hasn't been, and you're not just repeating something that somebody else did already. Correspondence, we had quite a few correspondences published last year, and that was really to do with the pandemic and the coronavirus issue. Full length articles, these are the ones that people like, and review papers, you know, we, we like the, the review papers as well. Now, we compare that to the previous year. Uh, funnily enough, the same number of papers were published, 101, but less correspondence, only one, you know, compared to nine, like I say, because of the issues. Um, and again, slightly more case reports were published in the previous year. So we actually had less review articles as well in the previous year, but you can see how some things are more attractive for a journal and some things are less attractive. Now, if you are an author, you might be interested to know what our um, acceptance times are. And this is what we call submission to first decision. First decision could be reject, accept, minor corrections, major corrections. And on average, we take, well, now we take about 10 weeks 
to get to that. So just over um, you know, two and a half months thereabouts. The, um, the, gr the light gray bar, which it says 20 point something weeks, 20.8 weeks, that's from the author submitting the paper to that paper being published online with a digit, digital objective identifier, a DOI number. And that's when the paper is a, is a paper. That's when it can be cited. But just look at the, um, the dark gray bar, which is the initial submission to the um, final publication of that. And that's, you know, 44 weeks. That's nearly 10 months. Um, that's a long time. So, you know, from the initial submission, your paper won't actually be in hard copy for nearly 10 months. So if you have information that you really want to share with people now, then maybe a peer review journal isn't the best place for that. Maybe you should go to a non-peer review journal where they can publish it quickly. You know, I, I submitted an article to a non-peer review journal at the beginning of December. It was published two weeks later in hard copy. So, you know, it, it can be a very quick turnaround with a non-peer review journal. But with a peer review journal, there is a long process to go through. Now, for example, at the moment, I'm getting papers um, into content and TRI related to coronavirus, um, in some case reports. Now, by the time that they are published, it will be 10 months from now. So this will be, they will be published at the end of this year and early next year. In fact, at the beginning of 2022, we will have a themed issue. We always have a themed issue in the beginning of the year. So they probably won't be published until March next year. So that's quite a delay. So is that information about coronavirus still going to be valid in a year's time? So that's what I have to make the decision as an editor and maybe reject that. Now, having said that, you'll remember last year we had lots of information about coronavirus. And um, so some of these papers were published earlier. They still went through peer review, but instead of making them wait, we actually prioritized them and said, these, journal, these papers need to be published now and the other papers can all wait because this information is very important right now. And it's important that as practitioners and as the, as the industry and content, as we have this information right now and available to us. Now, the papers that we reject, what happens to them? Um, well, the, sometimes the authors will rewrite the papers and send them to other journals. And some of our papers go to International Ophthalmology or BMC Ophthalmology, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, the Journal of Ophthalmology, various journals you can see, uh, Current and Experimental Optometry. They've had a couple of our papers that we rejected. And the bottom, the green table just shows you that some of these papers are actually well cited. You know, so we had nine sites for that top paper, for example. So really, if we published that, that would have been good for our journal. So uh, you know, sometimes we, we do reject the wrong papers as well. Um, now, this is what we call an average citation impact. So th these are all the sort of key words around you know, ophthalmic care. Now, you can see the, the bigger words are the words that are cited more, refractive error, myopia. Uh, on the other side, you can see symptoms, astigmatism, surgery. These are all the words that are cited more. Uh, and then the words like, um, you know, uh, for example, education is cited less. Now, for content and TRI, the ones that we're citing, the ones that we publish are the red areas, the hot areas. We don't publish the cold ones. So we don't really publish things on uh, a lot of things on, um, you know, OCT, for example. We don't publish a lot of papers on convergence or accom uh, amplitude of accommodation. Um, but we do publish more papers on discomfort and dry eye and contact lenses. So if you have a paper about convergence, then you need to send it to another journal. Don't send it to contact and then TRI. Now, I'm just going to finish off just to give you this information that, you know, you keep hearing information about impact factors. Well, what is an impact factor? It's a little bit complicated. So I'm just going to try and simplify this as much as I can. But basically, in June 2020, so the middle of last year, the impact factor for that journal, for Content Lens and TRI, of the previous year was released. So the 2019 impact factor was released in 2020. The 2019 impact factor is how many times the papers in that journal from 2017 and 2018 are cited by authors in 2019 divided by the number of papers published in 2019. And that gives you your impact factor. Why is impact factor important? Because it adds prestige to the journal. Not every journal has an impact factor. There must be 
um, I, I'm guessing, but there must be 200 ophthalmic journals in the world, maybe more, I'm not, I'm not sure. But 60 of them have an impact factor. You know, British Journal of Ophthalmology, American Journal of Ophthalmology, Cataract and Refractive Surgery, uh, Ophthalmic and Physiological Optics, Optometry and Vision Science, Investigative uh, Ophthalmic and Vision Science, uh, sorry, Investigative Ophthalmology and Vision Science, IOVS. So these sort of journals, these have an impact factor. And as faculty mentioned at the beginning, of that list of 60, Content Lens Lanteri is ranked 20, which is actually pretty high. Uh, it's the highest ranked contact lens journal, for example. And these are our competitors, and I'm not going to talk about the competitors, but you can see the top line in the orange table. Uh, this, these are our impact factors, and you can see over the 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and the 2019 impact factor, it, it's been steadily rising. And in fact, in 2019, we had a, quite a big rise uh, of around 30%, and that was the biggest rise of any journal, actually, in, in 20, uh, for the 2019 impact factors. So you know, we were quite pleased with that going forward. What sort of papers get cited? Well, the most cited paper for content lens anterior seems to be this paper from 2010. It's a review of keratoconus. So even though that paper is now 11 years old, it still gets the most citations. The citations you can see on the uh, left-hand side, 42 citations uh, in, in last year. But over its lifetime, it's had 323. So it's had a lot of citations. So, um, if you were going to write a, a, a new review paper on keratoconus, that might be something which is needed now. You know, if a more up-to-date review on keratoconus, that might be cited quite well. Now, the other papers that were cited well last year, of course, coronavirus type things and those sorts of things as well, uh, but also papers that date back um, to 20, uh, 2008. You know, a review paper on um, drug delivery, for example, was, was well cited. Uh, a dry eye questionnaire, the, you know, the, the contact lens a dry eye questionnaire, the, the DEC-5, that was well cited because people are still interested in dry eye. The CLEC study, the Keratokona study, 2007, still well cited. This is slightly different. These are the most downloaded articles from last year. And you can see the most downloaded articles, not surprisingly, look at the top two related to the pandemic. Uh, and then even further down, uh, the fifth and sixth ones, are uh, the, the sixth one is the pandemic related as well. But you can see that, you know, what are the, the important topics from last year? The um, global trends in myopia, for example, also very well downloaded. This isn't cited. These are how many downloads uh, from Science Direct. This is the previous year, if you're interested. And you can see, obviously, the coronavirus ones weren't there. Um, and, this, and this is also quite interesting. This is, you know, because nowadays papers are, are also cited on social media. And this is our sort of top cited papers on social media, if you like. So often now when authors get their papers published, they'll put a link on Facebook or LinkedIn or something else. And they'll say, read my paper. And uh, you know, they'll put a link there. Um, so it, it is a way that the journal actually gets more attention. And the journals are now starting to look at the social media platforms and see how this um, affects. And you'll see the top paper on social media last year for, for content lens and TRI was the Lyndon Jones et al. paper on the pandemic. The second one was the editorial that I wrote with Fabrizio Zeri, uh, again, on the um, contact lens issues in, in COVID-19 time. So I know that was a lot of information there. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand back to uh, Fakradeen. I'm not sure if there are any questions and we can go through those now as well. But thank you for your attention. I know that's heavy going information. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sezat. I think, uh, thank you for giving us the overall view. I think that's really important for us to understand when we want to do some, uh, you know, work in terms of starting to do a publication, uh, we need to keep a lot of things in mind. And uh, thank you for taking us to the journey of, uh, you know, preparing ourselves. Just before I go to the first question, uh, Dr. Sezat, uh, you did mention about plagiarism and, you know, it's a very important thing uh, when reputed journals are concerned. So uh, should we do a plagiarism check at our end before submission? That's, that's, that's what I would like to know. Your yeah, opinion. I think you should. I think it's very useful. And, um, you know, the, the issues around plagiarism, sometimes we see papers that come through. And, and not, when the uh, plagiarism software picks these up, it doesn't just tell us um, what the plagiarism score is. It tells us where the information came from. And so, you know, for example, if I write a paper and it has got a 50% plagiarism score, the editor will see 
if that information came from one of my earlier publications or if it came from one of your publications, I might have copied your information. And that happens. And um, so we have seen both examples. We've seen people where they self-plagiarize. And we also see people where they sometimes copy from another source because they, they didn't want to write it all out again, the method or the introduction. Um, the, the one case we had, we actually had a complaint when I started with this journal maybe many years ago, where um, somebody read a paper and that the author had self-plagiarized and we had to contact the author and say, you know, you have to explain this. And then he explained that actually um, they're right. I did self-plagiarize, but the original one wasn't published in a journal. It was published in a conference and that was just a pilot study, but he sh should have declared that. Okay. So, um, but you know, so we didn't have, we, and, and in the worst cases, um, the journal can withdraw the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's really important because plagiarism is something uh, we need to be very careful about. And the, the, the other thought which comes to my mind, as you said, we probably self-plagiarize. Yeah. So, uh, you did mention put it into inverted commas. Does that help in uh, you know, uh, reducing the self-plagiarism? Yeah, well, basically, if you put it in inverted commas and put a reference, what you're saying is that I didn't write this. I yeah. copied it from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so that's acceptable. Uh, because you've referenced it correctly. Now, so I just saw a question pop up saying, what's the process for self-plagiarism? And it, it might be that you did a study and then you do the same study 10 years later with more people or with different people. Mm -hmm. Well, then you can refer to your old paper, but what you shouldn't do is just copy the methods out. Yes. But you should reference the old paper. Uh, you know, so you should say, you know, the purpose of this paper is to investigate 10 years on from the original work, whether there are any changes in in this you know you know i i did i can give you one example of that where um i think it was I, I can't remember the year now but it was maybe 20 years ago we published a paper on why patients have refractive surgery and then 10 years later we repeated the work and then you know we started the introduction saying that uh, this paper is based on the questionnaire from 10 years ago we want to see if anything changed in 10 years so the the old paper was referenced so there was some plagiarism of the questionnaire, for example, but that's, that is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Now, also sometimes, you know, uh, for example, if, if you and I both publish a paper on dry eye, our references will be very similar because we both will look on PubMed. So there may be the plagiarism call comes up and says, actually, the reference section from my paper is the same as uh, somebody else's paper. Also, that is acceptable. So the editor will look at that and say, okay, that, I'm happy with that because all they've done is use the same references. Mm -hmm. They haven't, you know, and they have to be the same references because of the topic. <laughs> so that's acceptable. That's right. Yeah. So it's not just the, the number or the percentage. Of no, no, no. You should be worried. It's the content, the quality. Correct. And, correct. and where it's come from. Yeah. Where it's come from. Uh, okay. And what it is. Yeah. That's right. And I think you did cover a bit about the cover letter. We are just taking some questions here. You did yeah. make or cover letter, anything to add on which you, we should be careful in putting in cover letter? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. That, you know, for, for Contents and TRI, we don't have to have the cover letter anymore. In the old days, of course, you know, you would post your uh, printed manuscript to an editor, and now it's all online. So we don't really need the same letter now, um, but you can sometimes you can fill it in on a box, but you just basically need to say, if the work has been published somewhere else and if it's been presented in a conference, because some conferences hold copyright. Yeah. And uh, for example, Arvo, they hold a copyright because they publish the abstracts in IOVS. So you have to be careful if you're publishing uh, in, and then you want to publish your paper in another journal. And then you just have to be careful that you have to make sure that what you're publishing in the other journal is different to what you presented at Arvo, because Arvo hold the copyright for that original one. Yeah. You, you can still present it and publish it somewhere else, but you need to change it slightly. Okay. Or probably okay. publish a full paper in the Arvo journal rather than just having the abstract there. Is that also a possibility? That's possible. Yeah. And, 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 and certainly that happens with the BCLA. The BCLA also holds copyright for abstracts and they publish abstracts. Uh, but then if you wanted to publish your work in the BCLA journal content and TRI, they will, they will not say, oh, you already published the abstract. We don't know what's happening. Because it's in the same journal, they accept it. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they don't. They because they hold the copyright. They hold the copyright. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the second part of this question: How to impress the editor for him to decide? Uh, th that's a good question. Um, I, how to answer that is basically make sure uh, you know. There, there's some, when I'm reading a paper, there are some things which when I read it and I think, oh, I'm just going to reject this. <laughs> and it's usually if it's written in a very poor way that I just can't get the information out. So if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't flow nicely, if it's not easy to read, that usually is something which, you know, because it's going to be too much work for the reviewers to check it and for the author to change it. So it's better that the author just rewrites it. And um, that's one reason, if it's really poorly written. Second reason, if it's doesn't offer anything new, if it's just a repeat of the work you did before or somebody else did. Now, it's acceptable to repeat work if you're doing something different. For example, I was speaking with some people in a hospital in, in Bihar recently, and they wanted to do, publish some work on um, the prevalence of refractive error in a rural community. Now, there are lots of papers like that, prevalence of refractive error in rural communities. But what's different is that they have nothing in that area. So they need to put that in the title. So they would say prevalence of refractive error in uh, rural Bihar or something like that. So then somebody can say, okay, I can see now what they're doing is, you know, and, and in, in the introduction, they can say, you know, there have been papers that show the prevalence of this in this care, this area, this area, but nothing in Bihar, you know, and, or maybe that you know, they could compare illiterates with, with literacy or something like that, you know, refractive error and literacy rates. So there, there are things that you can do that to make the paper a little bit original. So, so yeah, make the paper original and um, you know, especially case reports, because case reports, if they're not original, they will get rejected. Yeah. You know, so, you know, case reports, um, you know, re recently I rejected a case report from a, from a very good team of authors, which was talking about dry eye using um, face masks. And in my opinion, it's not really something which needs to go in, in a peer review journal. It needs to go in a non-peer review journal. It need, that message needs to go out quickly to everybody. And for it to go into a peer review journal, it will take too long for the message to come out. Now, for the authors, it's better for them. They wanted it in a good, you know, a better journal. But for the public and for the readership, it's better to have that information now. Yeah, that's right. And just coming back to the impress the editor portion, do you think the title of the article plays an important part as well? Like, for example, the atom study. So they have this small acronym, that the atom study. Do you yeah. think it's to come up with some kind of that catchy titles? Yeah, um, I think that's you, uh, that's very popular in the USA. They do that a lot. And, um, you know, the... the CLEC study, we recently got the CLEAR reports, um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's all sorts of these things. But um, I, I don't think it's that important and unless, um, you know, you're going to do something where, you know, and usually the ones, you know, I can think of, you know, I can think of the CLEAR study in the USA, contact lens uh, amongst young people, which was uh, you know, uh, Robin Chalmers and um, many other authors in that, that study. But it, it was one study with lots of papers. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they reported the papers from the, the clay study. You know, more recently, there was the European Dry Eye Network, the Eden Network, you know, and they had lots of papers. So, they, you know, they, they, this was the Eden papers, you know. So that, that's useful. If it's just one paper, it's probably not important to have a, an acronym. But if it's a series of papers, yeah, yes, it is. It's better. Okay, okay, fine. And... Uh... What goes wrong? Like you did mention that you use the passive voice and the third person voice. Yeah, that's a very, it's, it's again a very interesting question because, um, you know, one of the best journals in medicine is Lancet and they accept personal pronouns. So you can write, you know, we did this and we, we did that. But most journals don't accept it. And um, in ophthalmic journals, we're a little bit more old fashioned. You know, we prefer the classical way of writing in the third person. Now, if you do write personal pronouns, then um, what I would do is I would just write back to the author and say, could you change the personal pronouns, remove them? And that might be right at the beginning before we, re we review the paper, or it might be right at the end when I've accepted the paper. So I've, uh, you know, I've accepted the paper, I'm going to accept it, and I just write back to the author and say, you look, you just change the personal pronouns and then it's ready to go. And um, it, it, you know, we, we, we feel that the writing style reads better. Now, where that's slightly different is in a letter to the editor, or in an editorial, of course, you do use personal pronouns. 
because you know you're writing to the author you know dear uh, editor we read the paper by bergman sen from 2018 and we disagree with his conclusion you know so you can say something like that and uh, so that's a personal opinion type of you know thing yeah. and uh, yeah this is again something interesting i think you would probably give us <laughs> 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 that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. You know what? We get invitations all the time, you know, and um, not just invitations from journals, but to conferences that don't exist. And, um, you know, so, you know, somebody will just copy and paste. You know, I, I had one recently that somebody said, we read your paper on contact lenses in the time of COVID-19. We would like you to present your work at the uh, mechanical engineering conference <laughs> so it's completely unrelated you know? <laughs> or they will ask you to go on to an editorial board as well so yeah in the publishing world we call this predatory journals journals that are hunting for people and uh, trying to catch people and you know look on the web to see if the journal has an impact factor usually these are open access journals and um and what that means is you pay to publish in that journal. Now, having said that, some of these open access journals actually get good impact factors because the reader can have the journal for free. The author pays for the paper to be published. Mm -hmm. So you have to make that decision. You have to think, OK, well, this journal has an impact. You know, I mentioned clinical ophthalmology, for example. They had a lot of our papers. They are an open access journal with a good impact factor and you have to pay to publish in those journals. Um, but I think you have to make that decision whether you think the journal has a good reputation. If the journal had no impact factor and was asking for a lot of money, then I probably wouldn't publish there. If it had a good impact factor uh, and we're asking you to pay to publish for open access, then you might consider that. So okay. it's, um, yeah, so it's, you just have to be careful and you know, see who, the other thing you can do actually is another interesting thing you can do is look at the journal's webpage and see who is on their editorial board. And uh, if you never heard of them, then maybe that's not a good sign. If you think, oh, these are the key people, then, you know, you, you'd be quite willing to publish there. Uh, you know, in Content and Zantiri, we're quite proud of our editorial board. They are really the global experts in, in this field. You know, people like Mark Wilcox and Eric Pappas and uh, Stephen Vincent and Jan Bergmanson and Barry Wiseman. These are really big, you know, authorities in, in the field of contact lenses. That's right. Any website which we can go and search out for the journal if, if there's any on, you know, where, where they have a list of uh, journals and then we can yeah. just... Yeah, you, if you do a search, you know, for impact factors, you can find a, a website that has a list of impact factors. Okay. Uh, so you can certainly find that list. And, um, but like I said, even some of those journals on that list may be open access whether you still pay. So you probably have to look at the individual journal, you know, webpage, for example. Uh, but, but also it depends what you're publishing. You know, I've, I've published something in the uh, Korean Journal of Ophthalmology before because it was something which was relevant to the Korean ophthalmic community. You know, so this was a, you know, you'd consider it to be a lower ranked journal. It doesn't have an impact factor. Uh, it, it wasn't open access. It was a, 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 we didn't have to pay for that. But, you know, for example, you might think, I want to get this information out only in India. So I want to publish it in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. So sometimes you will use other journals. That's right. Yeah. And coming to the, the charges, we are talking about payment. So where, where do you think we should get the funding to process the... the yeah. Um, I mean, hopefully your institution can support this. And um, if you think that, you know, this paper is worth publishing in that journal, then you can usually speak to, in, in our university, you know, we, we deal with our research office and our librarians, uh, and uh, they would make the decision whether that's worth publishing and spending money on that publication. And um, so that's how they would do it. The other way, of course, is, you know, sometimes uh, if I don't get institutional funding, if I'm funding it myself, it may be that I had a research grant, and part of the research grant was to publish so there was a fee for the publication. So, you know, we, we asked for $10,000 for the research project and we saved $1,000 to publish the paper as well or something like that. You know, so that sometimes you can build it into your research grant as well. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I think, a good uh, takeaway when we are writing the research grant. We should keep, a mind, keep in mind mm -hmm. that some percentage should be kept aside as yeah. a fee towards the publication. Probably that would 
uh, yeah, and, and not just the publication, but also the presentation of the conference, because it might be that you want to present this at the American Academy of Optometry. That's going to cost $5,000 <laughs> to go there for one week, flight, accommodation, meals, cost, you know, registration costs. It's going to be expensive. Yeah, so all these things can be kept in mind while application or while yeah, uh, putting yeah. up the research proposal. Yeah. A couple of more questions. Uh, uh, often manuscript goes through a couple of reviews before uh, being accepted. Have you come across any manuscript that got rejected in the first attempt without reviewers or editors? I think you did mention some yes. points, yeah. but anything you would like to highlight? Yeah, so definitely we have papers that are rejected at first attempt without any reviewers' comments, but the editors will make comments. So the editors and the editorial board will review the paper and will comment on it. Um, but to be accepted at first attempt without any reviewers' comments is, I've never come across any. The, the only time actually is a letter, maybe one or twi once or twice, somebody wrote a letter and it was relevant. It was a short letter. It wasn't related to another paper, but it was important. Um, so we didn't have to peer review that. But the, the review is done by the, the editor. But that doesn't count as a peer-reviewed publication, although it's in that publication. It's still a, it's a letter. That's right. Yeah, okay. So it, it, most of the time it has to, or it does go under peer review process. Yeah, yeah. Anything, that, anything which is a, a full-length paper or even a short communication or a case report will definitely go through peer review before it's accepted. It won't be accepted without. Without, okay. That's right. And... Uh, this is probably for beginners. So should should beginners start with case report or case series? That's that a really good question. That's a really good question. And um, if you're a beginner and you are in a practice, then yes, you should start with a case report and a case series because you're you're hopefully you're seeing unusual things. Mm -hmm. And but don't be upset if you send it to a big journal and they reject it. So then you need to think, okay, which journal will accept this type of case report? And case reports are becoming more popular. And in fact, um, the publisher of, of the Content and Anterior Journal is, is a publisher called Elsevier. And Elsevier have started a new case report journal called American Journal of Ophthalmology Case Reports. Mm -hmm. And um, they're also thinking about doing one for optometry because we're having more and more case reports submitted. And they're thinking maybe this is another opportunity to publish these papers somewhere else. So yes, you should think about case reports if you are um, a beginner. If you are uh, a master's student or a PhD student and you're a beginner like that, then think about your literature review. And the literature, you know, if your topic was on um, uh, you know, rural pre prevalence of refractive error, like we were talking about before, then you've got a literature review that talks about the prevalence of refractive error in all sorts of communities. So mm -hmm. you could write a nice review paper on the prevalence of refractive error, you know, amongst children or amongst rural communities or amongst illiteracy, you know, something like that. So you could write a really nice um, review paper so from your literature review. And often your chapter one of your master's or PhD will be a nice review paper. That's right. So that's where we can actually start as a beginner, yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And... Uh, what is the process to publish a product over self? Uh, I think you did talk about this, uh, you know. And then yeah, I, I mean, just to repeat, it's basically, it's very easy. So if you have published something before and you want to publish something updating that, just reference your old work. Reference your old work. That's right. And just coming back to referencing, do you recommend any, any uh, online referencing tools uh, which you think would help or uh, uh, you should... You, any personal preference uh, to be a, look. If, if you're writing a um, research paper and you might you're, you know you've got twenty references, you, maybe you don't want to have a, a reference manager type of uh, software. But if you're writing a review paper with one hundred references, that's a lot. And then suddenly you need to uh, make sure they're all formatted correctly. Then you know most people will use something like reference manager uh, or um, EndNote, those sorts of things. So then you should really try and use it. And, and most of these softwares will link with PubMed or Scopus so you can download papers into your um, EndNote library and then you can reference it correctly. And each journal will have its own kind of reference style, if you like. So you have to follow. I mean, you did talk about this also that yeah. you know, the formatting, the grammar, yeah. the 
Yeah, so follow the reference side of the journal, which is it's in the guide for authors. But if you've used something like EndNote and you use the wrong style, then it's very easy to change it. Yeah. Because you just reformat it with another um, output on EndNote. So, yeah. uh, you know, my, you know, when, when I started doing my master's degree, my, my supervisor was Professor Philip Morgan. And um, pretty much the first thing he said to me was, you're going to start to read the papers about this topic. Use EndNote. And uh, so, you know, I started using it many, many years ago when it was probably quite a new software then and um, and still use it now. So it's, you know, it obviously it's been updated many times since then. It's even more powerful now. But it was a really good piece of advice because um, you know, in my PhD, there may be 500 references, for example. Without EndNote, it was, would have been impossible. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And... Uh... Yeah, so this is again into academics perspective. So as a faculty advisor of any undergraduate research, is the faculty considered as a co-author together with student? That's one part of the question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. And can we as a co-author submit to a journal on behalf of the students? So any oh, very good question. Yeah. Um, Look, usually when you're, if you're supervising a project, I think you would make an agreement with the student. If you're the PhD supervisor, you would expect to be on that uh, paper because you are checking it. You've Some of the original ideas were yours. Uh, you may have been the person to apply for the funding for that project, um, but also you're reviewing the paper and you're helping writing it and you're analyzing the results. So you have enough criteria to be part of that, um, uh, the, the, of the author panel. Sometimes, and this happens a lot, that some students, they'll finish their PhD, they leave the university or their undergraduate studies, they leave the university, and they never publish their work. So then the supervisor is left with that work. If the supervisor wants to, of course, they, they can publish that work. Um, most universities have the uh, feeling that that work belongs to the university, not to the, to the student. Mm -hmm. And to the, the IP, the intellectual property belongs to the university. But I think it's good practice to put the student's name on it and probably just to inform the student that you're doing this. Now, some students will write back and say, yes, I'd like to check the paper as well. Some students will say, thank you very much. That's great. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy that you submit the paper. Yeah. Yeah. So we can be, I mean, as, as, as a co-supervisor, it can be submitted just that, uh, should we have to put it into the cover letter as a declaration? Is that is that necessary? Or? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, the, uh, when you put, list the authors, um, you know, th there's a statement that you have to agree to, and that basically would be that you were involved in the paper, and there's usually different criteria. So if you look at the international uh, ethics on journal publications, th there is a very detailed sort of list um, you know, of why you should be considered an author. And, um, you know, so th there, there is some guidance on this. That's right. And journals yeah. usually use that. Uh, um, we, we have had it happen, I think, two years ago. Um, I had somebody who, who was working for a company and then left the company. And, um, and the, some of the data that that person collected at the company was written as a paper later on without that person who'd left. And, and this person complained to the journal to us. And we went back to the original authors and said, this person has raised this complaint. They feel they should be on this paper. Um, can you explain why they're not on this paper? And um, at first the person, the author didn't reply. So then the journal threatened them and said, if you don't reply, we will remove this paper from PubMed and uh, we will withdraw the paper officially. So it's no longer listed. And then they replied and said, okay, yes, we will look, we'll consider this. And then we had some correspondence. Eventually this person was added afterwards so now if you search that paper you'll find this extra person has been added okay and is so it, it can be messy and journals don't like this so you know we, it, yeah. it was a big problem for us for, for a while when we were trying to deal with this but it's the correct thing to make it correct you know yeah. we had to go through the process because it's not fair for that author who's not on the paper okay and does that first name second name third name have some uh, importance yeah it's a, 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 another good question um um, again, if you, you know, if you and I were going to start a study together, um, we would agree who's going to be first author and who's going to be second author. Now, it might be that you and I are best friends and we don't have to, we don't have that conversation. And, um, and when the paper is written, 
we then decide and I say, look, Fakhreddin, you wrote more, uh, but I did all this and I did that. I think my name should go first. And you say, no, my name should go first for this reason. So we, we have an amicable agreement, but yeah. it's better to do it at the beginning. Okay. And um, you know, it's better to do it at, at the front. And the first author is, of course, a, an important author. The second author is an important author. The middle authors then become the sort of the middle group of authors. And also the last author is usually the person who got the funding for the project. Okay. So it doesn't have to be the most senior or the most junior, but it, it's usually the person who got the funding and uh, because they still have an important role. Without the funding, the work wouldn't have been done. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Usually as a PhD supervisor, you know, we often put our name at the end and the, the student's name at the beginning. Yeah. But but as a, as a supervisor, you can still go ahead and submit as a corresponding author. Just oh, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yes, yes. So the, if you are the last author or even the middle author, you can still be the corresponding author. Yes. Okay. So that does not relate to no. the hierarchy of this. No. Okay. No. But it, it might be, you know, in, in this case, for example, it might be that the student left the university yeah. and they're not interested in this work anymore. But the supervisor is really interested and it was their idea. They were doing this for 10 years already. And so they put their name first. That's, and right. that's fine. You know, they put their name first and then the, the student's name second. But the, you know, it needs to be an open discussion. And what I often say to my students is, if you, if you write the main parts of the paper, your name can go first. If I have to write the main parts of the paper, then I will put my name ahead of yours. That's right. Yeah, the, the person... I'll still put their name on it, but... Uh, Majority of writing, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that's a, a good way of looking at it. But, uh, you know, it, I think it, for, you know, you got to remember that for the junior faculty or junior for students, it's more important to get their name on papers for the senior faculty that they're, they're maybe less <laughs> uh, important for them. They, they had their paper, their name on many papers already. So for them, it doesn't matter so much. That's right. And, and sometimes you have this in a team of researchers. You'll have um, three lecturers working together, but one is very senior. And he says, look, I don't care where my name goes because it's more important for you and your promotion if your name goes ahead of mine. That's right. So sometimes that happens as well. Happens. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think, uh, Dr. Sazad, we have taken almost all questions. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, giving the time and answering and, you know, guiding us through. I think uh, yeah. we have, we have uh, you know, a lot of uh, information uh, already. And we can now start, you know, starting up slowly steps and going on to our route of publications and getting <laughs> assays published. Thank you so much. No worries. <laughs> Thanks very much. Have a good yeah. day, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. And just to let you all know that we do have session tomorrow. So probably I'll be seeing you in uh, 12 or 13 hours time. It's an early morning session. Uh, we do have a session on uh, conjunctival mysteries and I hope you all can join. So thank you everyone for attending uh, today's session. Take care and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.